Anyway, so good to see you guys. Well, not see you guys, but I get, good to be seen, I guess. Um, I wanted to start before uh, we went into the message. Uh, I just have uh, one announcement. It's kind of a long announcement, but one announcement. I'm sure a lot of you are uh, aware that the CDC has um, recently released um, guidelines for churches to look at concerning the, the reopening of um, local churches. And in addition to that, Governor Newsom has um, promised that he will release um, state guidelines uh, uh, about the same thing, about um, local churches being able to uh, reopen, and that is scheduled to happen on Monday. And so what that means for us is that um, we will likely be uh, reopening um, Sunday gatherings at Enclave Community Church in the next uh, several weeks. I don't know exactly when, but uh, I want to invite you guys to be praying. Be, be praying for the elders as we continue to um, discuss and pray over exactly when and how uh, we will reopen because it will likely be in a uh, modified way. So this is uncharted territory uh, for us. And so we're going to need um, God's uh, help um, in, in, in all of that. Also want to uh, in invite you to um, engage with us um, in this, uh, connect with us, contact us about um, concerns, ideas, um, prayers uh, about regarding uh, this uh, issue. Um, I can't, of course, uh, promise that all of your expectations are, are going to be uh, met, but I do we do want to hear your uh, ideas and concerns about it so we can take those into consideration and pray over those as well. So please be praying for the elders, but also uh, I want to ask that you would uh, be praying for each other, um, that we would be able to be gracious and kind um, with each other. Because the truth of the matter is, is that within our small community, there are so many opinions regarding COVID-19 and what the appropriate response to COVID-19 uh, would be, especially as it relates to uh, reopening um, uh, local churches. Uh, and so I've talked to some of you that are steps away from uh, joining a, a protest and ushering in the state of Jefferson. So that's that's on one side. And I've talked to some of you who wish that we could be closed for maybe a couple of months. So that, that's a that's a really broad range of opinions um, concerning that. So let's let's be praying um, that, that we can show each other kindness and respect um, relative to that. Uh, but then also, I want to remind us that although COVID-19 is, is um, serious and important, and our reaction to COVID-19 is serious and important, that what's even more important is that we keep Jesus, his person, and his ministry, his gospel, the very center of our focus. So at Enclave Community Church, we want to be united around Jesus, not united around a, a political persuasion, not united around our opinions of how exactly we should reopen. We can, we can work with each other in that, um, but let's put Jesus at the center and, and move towards um, Jesus. I want to remind you of our mission our mission is to be growing in union with God and each other as we encounter and as we enjoy and as we express Jesus together everywhere God sends us. Now, just because that's our mission statement, that doesn't mean that that's being accomplished. In fact, that mission is impossible apart from Jesus. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. It tells us in John chapter um, 15. So with that being said, we really need God's guidance. And so let's take some time now uh, to, to pray and ask for God's help, uh, both uh, with this issue, but then also as we turn our attention um, to the word of God, where we hope to see 
Jesus there. Let's pray together. Father, um, we, we do not want to lean on our own understanding. And Father, um, we, we do want to respect the, the recommendations of our government and uh, the recommendation of health experts. And uh, we want to respect each other. But above all, Lord, we want to honor you and, and we want to hear from you. So God, I'm, I'm asking that you would do the impossible, that you would give our local congregation unity and help as we uh, reopen, Lord. Guide the elders in this decision, Lord. We, we acknowledge you, and you tell us that you will make our paths straight, Lord. So we, we acknowledge you right now. Lord, the truth is, is that we don't, we don't know what we're doing. And in many ways, we don't. Uh, we just barely understand this virus and the implications of it. And we don't um, pretend that we are experts in any way about it or what you're doing or what you want to accomplish. But we are confident, Lord, that you're, you're bringing your kingdom, Lord, through Jesus Christ. And we want him to be the center of our focus. And so now as, as we turn to your, your word and the gospel of Mark, um, Lord, help us to truly encounter Jesus and enjoy Jesus and then equip us to express Jesus wherever you send us, God. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, so I don't know about you guys, but uh, in our household... And this happens maybe at least once a week. One of our children will come in from the outside and they'll be dirty. And so we'll ask them to wash up. Now most of the time they're perfectly fine with that. But every once in a while they'll say, I don't need to wash up. I'm not dirty. And so we'll have to point out like, well, uh, look at that mud smeared on your leg or Look how your shirt is like completely soaked in sweat. Like you, you need to, to wash up. See, they are dirty. They just don't see themselves as dirty. Now, now this is a huge theme in the New Testament, especially in the gospel, especially as it relates to the, the Jewish leaders. This idea of being unclean, but maybe not recognizing that you're unclean or having difference of opinion on what it means to be unclean. So last week we talked about the issue of uh, defilement, right? And ritual uncleanliness, which is not exactly the same thing as uh, being hygienically clean, right? Uh, not like our kids coming in with dirt or mud on their, their legs. It's something uh, slightly different for that. It's actually not even um, directly related to morality, although it's somewhat related in some aspects. When we talk about ritual uncleanliness, we're talking about those things that when you interact with them, uh, they are associated with sin and death, so they make you ritually um, unclean. And so things like touching a, touching a corpse would make you uh, unclean, or if you developed a skin disease where your 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 skin was sort of rotting away, that would make you uh, ritually unclean. And it, and it wasn't a sin in and of itself. Like th there's no law that says y'all you shall not develop a skin disease. Um, it wasn't a sin in and of itself, but it came as a result of the fall. It's because of the fallenness of of the world. God originally created the world without disease, without death. But corruption entered into the world as a result of the sin of our first parents, um, Adam and Eve. And so G uh, God, through Moses, gave the children of Israel purity laws that we talked about last week in Leviticus chapters 11 um, through 15. And that helped the children of Israel identify those things that would make them ritually unclean and then it prescribed for them things to do when they became unclean. Because you would, one day, somehow, you would get unclean. That was kind of like inevitable as you were walking through the unclean world full of disease and death. And so you would, 
You would go outside the camp. That's where things were dealt with uh, when you were unclean. You, you would go through a cleansing ritual. You would offer a sacrifice to atone or cover your uncleanliness. And as the way that this sort of works was that there was these degrees of cleanliness, purity, and holiness within the camp of Israel that we talked about last week. The most holy place in the camp was in the Holy of Holies in the tent of meeting. And in the room right in front of that was the holy place. And those two rooms together made the tent of meeting. And then there was the temple yard with a, with a bronze basin and, and an altar there. And then outside of that, so you're going from more holy to less holy. Outside of that were the place where the, the children, uh, uh, the, the priesthood was. And then outside of that, there was the the tribes of, of Israel, and then you would go outside the camp. And outside the camp was the, the place where things that were unclean, they were dealt with. So that's where you would figure out, what am I going to do about the skin disease that I have? That's where you would take the carcass of a, of a dead animal and you would burn it outside the camp because it's, it's unclean. That's where a human excrement was dealt with outside the camp and see in all of this what God was teaching was I want to dwell in the midst of my people which is basically like the message of the Bible I want to dwell in the midst of my people but there's a problem I am the holy clean God of life and the world in which you walk is full of sin and death so there's going to be, there's going to have to be a way where you could be made clean to be able to approach me. And that's sort of like the message of the book of Leviticus. And so God gave these purity laws and they, in one sense, they set Israel apart from the rest of the nations. The other nations around them, they didn't have uh, purity laws. They were God's chosen people set apart to be holy because God is holy. Now, all of that stood in the background at the conflict that we looked at last week between the Pharisees and this delegation of scribes that came up from Jerusalem and Jesus over the issue of defilement. And the Pharisees said, we, we want to make sure that Israel is pure and ritually clean. And so they said to everyone, we want all of you to, to be held to the, the purity standards of the priests in the temple in your homes, which included washing your hands before you ate a meal. And this is what they were getting on Jesus about. Your disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat. They felt, man, if the, the children of Israel could be pure enough, then God would make life go well for them, and then he would kick out, and this is exactly what they thought, they would kick out foreign oppression. They would kick out foreigners. Now, if you remember uh, Jesus' response to this, he's saying, okay, um, you're actually not understanding the Old Testament correctly. You, you are adding things to what my Father has said, and in so doing, you're actually taking away from the true message that God was trying to bring across even in the purity laws. Those were actually cultural symbols to help you understand that you are unclean before a clean God. And that uncleanliness, he said, defilement comes from within. The problem is an unclean heart that, that manifests itself in unjust, prideful, unloving behavior towards other people. And so the purity laws were meant to be understood through the lens of the gospel, we said last week. We, we need a Messiah to come and cleanse us from the inside out. So that was last week. Now this week, Jesus is going to take all these ideas even farther. He is going to go outside the camp. He's going to go outside the camp and interact with an unclean outsider. Because if you think about the Pharisees, they basically assumed that they were on the inside, right? That they had to make sure that everybody else was following the purity laws because they felt it was incumbent upon them as insiders 
to usher in the kingdom of God. So think about the, just the, the hubris of that. But then Mark wants to ask the question, who is the kingdom of God really for? Who, who's Jesus' kingdom really for? Is it for people who think that they're clean already? Like my kids sometimes when they come from outside covered in mud? Or is it for people who are on the outside who recognize that they are defiled? <clears throat> so this question, who is Jesus's kingdom for, is answered in our passage this morning. Our, our passage, this, this uh, recorded event from Jesus's life is designed to answer that question. And it does so by doing three things. First, we are introduced to an unclean outsider. That's our first point this morning. We're introduced to, to that person. Then we're going to be given a riddle by Jesus concerning his relationship to outsiders. And, and then we'll see how that uh, comes together. And then we're going to see who it is. Is it insiders or outsiders who have ears to hear and respond to Jesus's ministry and message. So those are our three points this morning. Our passage comes from Mark chapter 7 verses 24 through 30. Let me read them for you now. There it says, and from there, so from the Jewish area of Gennesaret, he, that is Jesus, arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not uh, be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard him and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Seraphonician by birth. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Verse 27. And he said to her, let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Verse 29. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So who is Jesus's kingdom for? That's what this passage is answering. And it answers that question first by introducing us to an unclean outsider from outside the camp. <clears throat> Jesus leaves the Jewish area of Gennesaret and he goes to the region of Tyre and Sidon, outside the camp. This area is probably most well known for being the home of Jezebel. Do you remember Jezebel? From 1 Kings chapter 16, we're introduced to her there. She marries one of the kings of Israel, King Ahab. And then she introduces Israel to Baal worship. And then she has many of the prophets of Israel that, that serve Yahweh killed. And so she becomes the archetypal wicked woman in the Bible. She's actually referenced in sort of like this symbolic way, even in the book of, of Revelation. So this area that Jesus goes to is most well known for her. Now, in, in the first century, this was still a Gentile region and it was utterly pagan. And it wasn't long before the scene that we're looking at this morning where the people of Tyre joined forces with other countries to come against Israel during the Maccabean uh, revolt. And so Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, said that the people of Tyre were one of Israel's bitterest enemies. So Jesus goes to that region and there he meets an unclean um, outsider who has many strikes against them right from the outset. This outsider, for one, is a woman. And in first century, uh, uh, the, the Israel's regard for women was in decline, actually. 
Um, their words wasn't even admissible in a court of law. And the rabbis taught during this time that it was a waste of time to teach your daughter the Torah. So imagine that she's a woman. And then on top of that, she's a Seraphonician by birth. That means she's from this place of Tyre and Sidon. And then if you look in the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 15, there she is called a Canaanite. So that ancient arch nemesis of Israel that once occupied the promised land, who were known, their reputation was for being wicked and violent, engaging in child sacrifice, being called to repentance for over 400 years before God had to oust them out of the land. So all of these things, from, from the perspective of first century Judaism, put her at the very opposite um, spectrum of the Jewish leaders that Jesus was talking to last week. She is about as unclean as you can get. She's from the wrong region. She's from the wrong ethnicity. She has the wrong religious heritage. There's many things that are wrong with her from that vantage point. And then on top of that, she has a daughter with a what? An unclean spirit. So this is exactly the type of person that the Jewish leaders would have avoided. She is a person who is outside the camp, unclean to be avoided. So what is Jesus? How is he going to interact with this woman? So there's this tension that's created in the story, especially for a first century Jew. Oh my goodness, he's encountering this woman from this, this area. But I also wonder uh, something about us. I think many of us, um, we wouldn't want to admit it, but we actually look at people more like the Jewish leaders than Jesus. I mean, we, we know that Jesus said defilement comes from within. But then we judge whether or not to associate with certain people based on externalities. What do they wear? What do they wear to church? Do they, how do they talk? Like, do they speak English well? Are they the same race as us? What kind of hairstyle do they have? Do they have a tattoo? Is it, is it like small? Maybe we'll let them go with that. You know, is it small? Or does it like cover their whole arm? Or is it on their neck? Or even their face? Do they have piercings? Is it in their ear? Or do they have one in their eyebrow? Or nose? Or tongue? And, or who knows where else, right? And so we say on the basis of externalities, maybe we don't use this kind of verbiage and maybe we know we would never say it out loud, but in our mind we say unclean to be avoided. So what will Jesus do, right? He said with his words last week that defilement comes from within, but now he is meeting this unclean woman, what will he do now? Who is Jesus's kingdom for? That, that brings us to our second point, where Jesus answers that question by giving us a riddle, a riddle that is actually pretty difficult to understand, but is really powerful once you unlock it. Let's look back at our passage uh, in verse 26. There we read, now the woman was a Gentile, a Seraphonician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, some of you know that uh, Sarah and I are going to celebrate tomorrow our 18th wedding anniversary. So Sarah and I have known each other for almost 24 years. So that's almost a quarter of a century. And because of that, I can pretty much guess what Sarah is going to say in any given moment. And she could do the same for me. But sometimes she says things out of character. And I'll, I'll go, wait, what? It, I'll be surprised about that. I, I've been walking with Jesus, because Sarah introduced me to Jesus, actually, for about the same amount of time, 24 years. And 
as I've been reading the gospel over a couple of decades now, I can pretty much guess what Jesus is going to do and say in any given moment, except for this time. It just seems surprising what he said. It's like, wait, wait, did Jesus say that? Like, in some ways, it, doesn't it sound like he, he sounds more like the Jewish leaders in, in some ways. What exactly is going on here? And you're going to see this unfold, and you might be surprised at the end. But what you have to remember about Jesus is that he often spoke in uh, parabolic language, riddle-like language. And sometimes when we think about parables, we, we think of a, of a long parable, like the parable of, of the Good Samaritan. We think about um, it being that way, but oftentimes they were short little sayings. Uh, just last week, Jesus, when he was talking about defilement, he said, think about it. When you eat food, it goes past your heart, into your stomach, and out your body. So it can't defile you from within. That's short. And Mark called it last week a parable. Right? And there's lots of these little riddles that, that uh, Jesus gave. And they're like, a, they're like, remember we used to talk about stereograms. And I had one that I was going to bring and I left it at home. I'm just realizing it right now. So, but in, 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 a, in a stereogram, if you've ever seen them before, it, it's like it reveals something and conceals something at the very same time. And, and the stereogram that we have looked at before, if you were to cross your eyes and then kind of look through it, then like this 3D squirrel would uh, uh, emerge. I wish I, I wish I would have brought it so you could see what I mean. But so with, with the stereogram, there's something that's revealed, but then there's something that's concealed. And only those who have eyes to see can see it. And so when we were back in Mark chapter 4, we talked about how parables are the same way. The parables reveal true things about Jesus's kingdom, but in a way that's concealed so that only those who have ears to hear can hear it. They're like a riddle that both reveals and conceals. And like a riddle, uh, within a, a riddle, there are clues to its meaning that if you get, then it, it, it kind of like unlocks the meaning. And so what Jesus does in this riddle, there are clues in the riddle for her. If she has ears to hear, that will unlock its meaning. But then there are also um, clues for the reader of Mark as they look outside the riddle to be able to understand what Jesus is saying here. So on the surface of things, it seems like pretty straightforward, right? Let's read it again. Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to, to the dogs. So children, who are they? Who could they be referring to? The children of, of Israel. If you, if you look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, the children of Israel are called the firstborn son of, of Yahweh. What is the bread? The bread is Jesus' kingdom, ministry, and message. Well, then who are the dogs? Well, that's a derogatory way that the Jews talked about the Gentiles. And you think, wait a minute, like this does sound like the, the Jewish leaders. And if the Jewish leaders were there, they would say, yeah, you, you tell them, Jesus. And then they would be like, but there would be something uncomfortable about, comfortable about it. They, they, they wouldn't like a couple of choices of words would make them feel uncomfortable. And it's actually those words that become part of the key of unlocking the riddle. The first word is the word first. Let the children be fed first. So what does that assume? It, it anticipates that there would be an opening up of the kingdom for the Gentiles as well. Now think about how the Jewish mind thought about it during the time of the first century. They were thinking, to usher in the kingdom, we have to kick the Gentiles out. That's how they, that, they got to kick the foreigners out, right? That's how they thought about it. But that's not what the Old Testament taught. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God speaks to Abraham and he says to Abraham, in you, all the families of the world will be blessed. Or if you look in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, there is a servant song concerning the Messiah there. And it says that when he comes, he, he's going to bring back the preserved of Israel, the remnant of Israel. And then he's also going to be a light for the Gentiles. 
And why is he going to be a light for the Gentiles? It goes on to say in that passage, so that salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And if you look at places like Isaiah chapter 2 or in Micah chapter 4, the prophets picture a situation where the nations flood into Zion to receive blessing from Yahweh. Or listen to Psalm chapter um, 86 verse 9. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. Now, these verses don't deny that Israel has a special place in God's redemptive plan. But they were actually chosen to be the vehicle through which God would bless the entire world. So God, he out of the nations, he chose Abraham. From Abraham came Isaac, and then Jacob, and Jacob, the children of Israel from there, and then also from Judah would come one who would have a scepter, a king. The David came out of that line, and David would have a son, the son of David. So by the time you get to the middle of redemptive history, you're expecting a son of David. That's Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus came in his ministry. He died and he rose again from the dead. And then his kingdom message is spread throughout Judea, Samaria, and the nations. That's kind of like that funneling to Jesus' cross It is like the structure of the whole Bible. And so Paul will say in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek or the Gentile. So the first little clue that Jesus gives in this riddle is the word first. But the second clue is the word dogs. Now don't get me wrong, the, the, the Jewish leaders, they are happy to call Gentiles dogs. And, and what they have in their mind is not Fifi at home like you have. They, they have like this scavenger dog that is roaming around the streets that's happy to eat its own vomit and, and things like that like a dirty dirty um, animal <clears throat> but Jesus actually doesn't use that word he uses a diminutive form of the word that means little dog or even puppy so he says yeah you puppy <laughs> so they're kind of like in the Jewish leaders like yeah, like they don't even understand exactly what that means. Like they didn't, Jews didn't have like uh, dogs as pets, but the Gentiles did. And so it's like he's saying, like, yeah, family puppy, like you're gonna be fed as well. And these things kind of throw it off for for what the Jewish leaders would expect. So those are just two clues that Jesus gives to this woman. And then we're going to see what this woman does with that in a minute. But then there's also clues for the, the readers of Mark as well, in the broader context of Mark. This is not the first time that Jesus has interacted with the unclean Gentile. Back in Mark chapter 5, Jesus goes to the area, the Gentile area of the Decapolis, and there he meets a, the Gerasene demoniac. That's how we understand him. So who's he? Well, think about it. He's a person with an unclean spirit. Okay, where does he live? It says, among the tombs. So you're not supposed to touch a dead corpse. And that's where he lives, with the dead corpses. And then he's surrounded by what? The, remember the herdsmen get upset with Jesus? Swine. So here's a man with an unclean spirit, sleeps among dead people, surrounded by pigs. Like this, this is about as unclean as you can get in the Jewish mind. And yet Jesus goes directly there to find this man and then delivers him from an unclean spirit. So evidently, Jesus's ministry is to unclean Gentiles outside the camp. And then this is not the last time Jesus interacts with the unclean Gentile. Immediately, immediately after this passage that we're looking at this morning, Jesus goes back to the Gentile area of the Decapolis and he heals a deaf man who has a speech impediment. So evidently, Jesus' kingdom extends outside the camp to unclean Gentiles. And then Jesus leaves another little clue 
in this little riddle that he gives. And that word is be fed. <clears throat> Let the children be fed first. Now, this is, a, this is a unique word that is significant because it's used in a place before this passage and then in a place after this passage. It's used in the feeding of the 5,000 where, where the Jewish people that were there in that feeding were satisfied with what the Messiah gave them with 12 whole baskets left over. So there's implications even in that. But then this word is used again in Mark chapter 8 in the feeding of the 4,000. Have you, have you ever asked the question, why does there have to be a feeding of the 5,000 and then a feeding of the 4,000? I mean, the gospel writers don't include every single event in Jesus's life. Wouldn't it be okay just to have one feeding, right? We get it. Jesus can make a lot of food out of a little bit of food, but there's more to it than that. The feeding of the 5,000 is in the area of the Jews. The feeding of the 4,000 is in the area of the Gentiles. And so Jesus, by inserting this little word, is for those who have ears to hear, he's saying, I, I want you to think about the implications uh, of, of this. Like, there, there, there are Gentiles that are going to be satisfied with my food as, as well. And so Jesus gives this riddle. And these aren't the end of the clues, and we'll see another clue, maybe the most important clue, at the end of, of our third point. <clears throat> but Jesus gives this riddle, and he gives little clues for the woman and for the, the market reader to be able to understand. Because when you first come across it, you think, is, is he just letting her know how he feels? Or is he intentionally being provocative in order to draw out of her a response, right? And so what I think we see Jesus doing is that he actually uses a lot of the words that the Jewish leaders may have used, but then he tweaks different words inside of it for those who have ears to hear. And then the question becomes, okay, well, who's going to really hear Jesus's kingdom message? Who is Jesus's kingdom really for? Is it for the insiders? Are they the one who's going to get the message? Or is it for outsiders? Dirty, outside the camp, outsiders. That brings us to our third point. Who has ears to hear Jesus's kingdom message? Let's look back at verse 27. There we read, And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Okay, so there are a lot of firsts here. For one, this is the first and only time that someone in the Gospel of Mark identifies Jesus as Lord. Think about that. In the parallel passage in, in Matthew chapter 15, she calls Jesus, this is a Gentile Seraphonician woman, calls Jesus the Son of David. So she identifies him as the Jewish Messiah. Did the Jewish leaders get that? <laughs> No, they're sending delegations from Jerusalem to put a stop to Jesus. But she says, no, you're the son of David. Here's another first. She's the first one to ever, quote unquote, win an argument with Jesus. Right. Normally, think about Jesus's ministry. Normally, when Jesus gives a short riddle like saying, people are rendered speechless and the plot line just keeps going. There's like no response. Let me give you two examples. Remember when the Pharisees asked if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said in Matthew, Which of you has a sheep if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not take hold of it and lift it up? That response is met with silence, rendered speechless. Or when they ask about, uh, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? 
Right? What does Jesus respond? He says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. And I wish I could go into the riddle of that because it's really, really um, um, powerful. But then listen to what it says after Jesus says that. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away, rendered speechless, but not so with this woman. She is not rendered speechless. Who has ears to hear Jesus' kingdom message? An unclean Seraphonician woman. Here's another first. She's the first person in the Gospel of Mark to really understand a parable of Jesus. It's as if Jesus, he lays down one, because she doesn't just understand it, she kind of completes it. Jesus lays down one piece of the puzzle. I, I imagine him almost like smiling and winking at her. She smiles, takes the other piece of the puzzle out, and then completes the puzzle. And she basically says, look, I, I know that you came for the lost sheep of Israel. She, she doesn't argue with Jesus on this. She, she knows that she is unclean and from the outside. But in, in effect, she also says, but I know something else about you. I know that one crumb that falls from your table is powerful enough to cast out demons because you are the bread of life. You are the Lord. You are the son of David. You're the Messiah, the Christ the son of the living God. So who's the first to make a profession concerning Jesus's identity? Is it Peter in Mark chapter eight? It's a Seraphonician woman in Mark chapter seven. It's, it's amazing. And so she's operating exactly in line with what is, what is commended in Isaiah chapter 56, verse three, which says this, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. If you belong to Jesus, that passage is saying, then you're not going to be separated from his people, even if you're an outsider, even if you're a foreigner. That's the Old Testament, guys. The prophet Isaiah said that. But then listen to how Jesus responds. And this is the final clue that helps us understand what Jesus was really meaning the whole time. We read in verse 29, And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. In the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 15, verse 28, he says, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Jesus is basically saying, you got it. You heard my kingdom message. And then he demonstrates by casting out this demon, even from afar, that he is not only the cleansing king of Israel, but he is the Messiah who will clean the whole world. How will he do it? He'll do it by defeating sin, death, and the devil on the cross where Jesus goes outside the camp, the book of Hebrews tells us, and dies a shameful death as an outsider so he could bring the outsiders in. Jesus is a powerful king and he establishes his kingdom through the cross. That's the message of the book of Mark. His kingdom is not for those who believe themselves to be clean already. Like my kids when they come from the outside and they don't want to take a bath, right? Or the Jewish leaders from last week. His kingdom is for those who understand themselves to be unclean and outside of the kingdom. Jesus is offering them to come in like this Gentile, unclean, Seraphonician woman who has a daughter with an unclean spirit. I want to ask you a question. If you're, if you're honest, and, and I want to invite you to 
Lay your heart bare before the Lord right now. If you're honest, who do you relate to in the story the most? Do you relate to the Jewish leaders? You, you, have, a, you have a hard time associating with people who don't look like you and don't act like you. If that's you, just, just own that for a moment and then bring that to the Lord. The Lord Jesus wants to tell you, come to me and I will make you truly clean. And in so doing, I will give you my eyes so that you see people the way that I see people. For others of you, you say, no, I, I, I really more relate with the woman. I feel so unclean. I feel like I'm on the outside. I didn't go to Sunday school growing up. I, I, I have led an unclean life in, in many ways. I can barely understand what the pastor is talking about right now. If you don't hear anything else, Jesus is saying to you, you don't have to defend yourself about being unclean. Come to me and I'll make you clean from the inside out. Who is Jesus' kingdom for? It's for those who are unclean, who are given eyes to see and ears to hear how beautiful and what a treasure Jesus and his gospel is and turn to him in true faith. Let's pray together. Father, um, we just stand in awe of your plan, but mostly we stand in awe of your son, full of wisdom and power and strength and grace and love and mercy and compassion. And we realize he is the Holy One of Israel. He is the Son of David. And we are unclean. And we need atonement. We need a sacrifice to be given. We need blood shed to cleanse us from our sin. Thank you for providing the perfect sacrifice. The once and for all sacrifice better than any blood from bulls and goats, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us, God, to follow him as our king. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.